one of the most um, well-known images of the entire book of Revelation, and in fact, something that people have heard of, even if they've never read the book of Revelation, is something called the Mark of the Beast. Now, where does that come from? Hey, guess what? It comes from today's chapter, chapter 13. We're going to look at that together. So let's walk through it. Actually, before we get to the first verse of it, let's remind everybody where we are. We are in the middle of John's second vision. He is seeing it from the doorway to heaven. He is in in the gap between the blowing of the last trumpet and the opening of uh, and the pouring of the first bowl. So 12, 13, and 14 is this gap in between. Now, why are these gaps happening? Here's why. Two reasons. One, because every time before God's judgment reaches a new and more severe level, God offers mercy to those who want to accept his offer of mercy. Secondly, before God brings another level of judgment, he always makes his case for why this is happening. So before he actually begins actively pouring his bowls of wrath upon the earth, he wants to be sure that everybody understands why. He doesn't just do it randomly. There's always a reason, and he wants us to know what that reason is. So in these chapters, God is making his case as to why the earth des deserves such a severe judgment. So let's take a look at how this continues. First of all, the first part of the judgment was uh, a history lesson back to before the beginning of time when uh, Satan and his angels rebelled. And that's why they are now uh, you know, overseeing this earth, because we gave it over to them with our sin in the garden. And uh, this session and the next session, chapters 13 and 14, will continue that idea of giving background and reasoning for what's about to come. Because of that, the timeline of Revelation, while it's fluid anyway, in chapters 12, 13, and 14 is very fluid. So we're going to try to put timestamps as best we can on the things that need timestamps, but it's going to be challenging because that's not the point of these chapters. The point of these chapters isn't to show you how it's going to lay out, but it's to give you God's reasoning as to why things need to happen this way. So it's not about when as much as it is about why. So let's take a look at it. Chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. Now, this is one of those images. Uh, every once in a while, somebody who's done some prophecy work will try to do a drawing of this. And to my feeling, the drawings of this beast never look scary. They just look silly. <laughs> a beast with uh, ten horns, seven heads. So which horn belongs on which head, plus crowns on it, plus a name on the heads. And I I'm not meaning to make light of it. I'm not. What I'm saying by that is you cannot perceive this literally as an actual physical beast coming out of the actual physical sea. It's real. It's true. But given that it's in Revelation, which is written in apocalyptic style of literature, which is highly symbolic, we're not talking about an actual physical beast coming out of the sea. We're talking symbols that tell us about what's going to go on. So let's decipher these symbols for the beast from the sea. First of all, it says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. The dragon, as we saw from last time, is Satan. That's not a question. It literally said so in the last session, as we saw. The dragon is Satan, the devil and Satan. He's standing on the shore of the sea, which means the shore is where the water meets the land. And as we've seen already in the book of Revelation, the land is a symbol for the people of Israel. They are tied to the land. And the sea is a symbol for the Gentile nations, especially for the Gentiles in their rebellion against God. So Satan is at a place where he's calling forth from the entire world, from both the Jewish and he, he is he's straddling this place of both the Jewish people and the Gentile people. And he calls a beast from the sea, from the sea. Actually, it doesn't say he calls it. The dragon was standing there and a beast came out of the sea. The, sea come, the, the beast comes out of the sea, which means out of the Gentile nations. And then it has this crazy description. So the question is, who is the beast? I'm going to tell you up front. The beast is the Antichrist. And then let's take a look at what we know about it and why we believe this beast is the Antichrist. First of all, it has seven heads. What does that mean? Well, seven is the number of completion uh, that is spiritual completion. 
uh, heads is always a symbol of intelligence because that's where the brain pan is, okay? So seven heads means this is a being with spiritual intelligence. Secondly, 10 horns. 10 is always the power of, of the number of human completion, 10 fingers, 10 toes, right? We've seen that before. Horns is always a symbol of power. So this is a, a being that has complete power over the earth. 10 crowns. Crown is authority. The difference between power and authority is somebody can have power because they've got a gun, even if they don't have authority to use it. Somebody else can have the authority to do it, but somebody else can overpower them. If you have both power and authority, which for instance, a police officer has. A police has the power within the gun and the authority of the badge, right? The two things together. 10 crowns, again, completion in the 10, crowns authority, so it has complete authority. And on each head is written blasphemous names. Names in, in, the, book, in the Bible in general, but names especially in Revelation, signify ownership. You name that which you own. When you buy a cat or a dog, you get to name the dog or the cat. The neighbor doesn't get to name the dog or the cat. The owner gets to name the dog or the cat. Naming signifies ownership. And a blasphemous name means it's against God, which means it's satanic. So this being, whether it's a country or a corporation or an individual, some kind of power, this is a power that will rise during the tribulation that has intelligence about spiritual things, that has the complete power of the earth, that has the complete authority over the earth, but is under the ownership of Satan. So there's a lot going on in those, but that's pretty straightforwardly what it means. Now, what are these powers that it has? Here's something interesting, and it's going to require a bit of jumping around, and you're going to tag it both in your head and in your Bible. What We've talked about this before. The simplest answer is always the one we're going to go to. And if the book of Revelation itself explains the meaning of a symbol, then we go with the explanation of the symbol offered in Revelation, right? Now, here's the deal. This image is explained, but not in this chapter. This image will be explained in chapter 17. So we are going to jump ahead to 17 to explain where we are in 13. So we're staying in 13. We will go through 13. But we're going to jump into 17 to offer an explanation about what we're going to watch in 13. So if you've got a physical Bible, put a tag in 13 and jump ahead to 17. If you've got it on a, on a laptop or something like that, then bring up another browser window. We're going to be looking at 17 as well as 13 that we're in. So jumping ahead now to Revelation 17, in order to explain the images from 13, here's what we read. Revelation 17, verse 3. And I know, I know I'm maybe feeling like I'm over-explaining, but th the jump back and forth, I'd rather explain it too much than not explain it enough and have people confused. Better for you to say, oh, come on, get on with it, than to go, wait a minute, what did he say? So I will over-explain. Sorry about that. 17.3 says this. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There, So this means it's the next vision. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Okay, we just had a beast come out of the sea. Now we've got a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Take a look at the screen. This screen is about chapter 13. The verse I just read is from chapter 17. It's an explanation of this beast that has blasphemous names uh, seven, uh, seven heads and ten horns. Jump ahead to verse 9 of Revelation 17. Revelation 17, 9 says this. This calls for a mind with wisdom. And here's where it's explained. The seven heads are, oh, we're going to get an explanation of what the seven heads are. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. So keep that in mind. We'll go back to it. That's an explanation of what seven heads are. We already knew that it's about spiritual intelligence, but now we're going to understand a little further. Seven hills, seven kings, five fallen, one is, one has yet to come, and he will remain a little while. So that's the explanation of seven heads. We'll get into it in a moment. Verse 11 of Revelation 17 then says, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. Oh, okay, so the seven heads are seven kings. An eighth king is going to come. 
he belongs to the seven, according to Revelation 17, 11. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. So we've got seven heads, which, which symbol, symbolize seven kings. Five have been, one is, one's about to come, um, and an eighth one will come after that. Verse 12. Uh, the ten horns you saw are ten kings that have not yet received a kingdom. So ten crowns, complete authority. So this, this symbol of great authority is yet to come, and it will be ten kings who are yet to come, who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They, will have, they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Let me, let's go through the most obvious. Remember, we go with simple first and move to complex. Simplest thing to understand is this. When it says in verse 9, the seven heads are seven hills upon which the woman sits, this was by far the easiest and most obvious symbol to understand for the first century Jews. Why? Rome, which was where the power center of their world was, Rome was built on seven hills. So any time in the first century when you referenced a power on seven hills, that was like today saying this came from the White House. Centuries from now, when somebody sees from the White House, they're going to go, which White House? There's lots of White Houses around. But today, when we go, no, this came from the White House, we understand that that means White House is symbolizes the power of the American presidency. So when you say this came straight from the White House, you're not talking about a physical White House, although it is a physical White House. What you are talking about is that it comes directly from the authority of the American presidency. In their day, Seven Hills meant what White House means today. It was absolutely universally true. So we know for sure that the Seven Heads means Rome. Now, some people have surmised that today that might mean the Roman Catholic Church because it's headquartered in Rome. I'm not going to say whether it is that or not. I don't know. But for the first century believers, it absolutely meant the power of Rome as they understood it at the time. So. Let's go from that to explain some more of this. So the seven heads are seven kingdoms in chapter 17, verse 10. Verse 10, they are also seven kings. So the seven hills, that's the power of Rome, that's worldwide power. They are also seven kings. So in addition to them conjuring up, oh, this means worldwide power like Rome has. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. So what does that mean? Well, the five fallen kingdoms in their era were Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. For the previous hunt, for the free, previous centuries, going way, 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 way back, there had been five great kingdoms in the world come and go. This would be outside of Asia, where China, being so physically separate from them, had their dynasties. But for the Euro greater European, African, around the Mediterranean area, the, these were the great um, the great kingdoms, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. So that's five. That's the five who have been. The one that currently is, obviously, is Rome. There's no other question than that. And that means there's another one yet to come. So the one that has not yet come is the kingdom of the Antichrist, because we have not yet seen that kingdom arise. So what it's telling us is there will come a kingdom that will rule over the world during the tribulation, that will be similar to the total dominance that Rome had over the greater Mediterranean area and over each of those previous kingdoms had over the known world at the time. That's what's coming during the time of tribulation. It also tells us that this final kingdom will be ruled in ten divisions. That's what the ten horns and the ten crowns are all about. That there's going to be, and, and we'll take a look at it in verse 12, it specifically says, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. So there are ten kings who will work in coordination to dominate the world authority, but they have not yet come, and they will be under the authority of the Antichrist. So you've got a whole lot going on. It also says they'll rule for one hour, which means for a short but very specific period of time. This tenfold kingdom also appears in Daniel chapter 7, so you can go back and look at that, but I'm not going to go back there because we're already in two different chapters. I don't want to throw a whole separate book in. But in Daniel 10, you've got a description of what appears to be a ten-nation kingdom uh, in three groups um, with uh, 
with three that dominate that as a, as a security council and it get the numbers get very, very complicated. So we won't dwell on that. But this gives you an idea of what's talking about the worldwide power that will dominate during the Great Tribulation will be made up of a group of some kind of 10. It will be under the power of the Antichrist and it will rule with the kind of cruelty and universality that Rome did and that the five world dominating kingdoms did before that. That's the shorthand version of what that means. All right, let's move along now to verse two. Yeah, all of that was just in verse one. The good news is when we get to 17, we will have already seen a bunch of that. So 17 will be a little shorter. Verse two, the beast I saw resembled a leopard. This is the beast that came out of the sea. Resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So the beast already has 10 heads, 10 crowns, right? All that stuff. And now it's got these. Again, it, it's not physical. It's not a physical beast. You can't put all of those things together into one being, it simply won't work. So this is another set of symbols to give you something else about the characteristic of this beast that comes now under the power of the tenfold kingdom. So this is now a reference to the beast, but more specifically to the beast as represented by this tenfold kingdom that will happen during the tribulation. Headache yet? Yeah, me too. Okay. So the tenfold kingdom will have these characteristics, the body of a leopard, feet of a bear, in the mouth of a lion. And each of those have very obvious symbolic meaning for first century Jews. The body of a leopard means fast and ferocious. The feet of a bear means strong and unmovable. And the mouth of a lion, remember who, what other lion have we seen in Revelation already? The lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So this is an attempt to imitate the mouth, what you speak, trying to speak like God. The Antichrist is going to try to mimic the real lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Again, Back in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, another piece of apocalyptic literature, it tells us of four beasts. Three of them have exactly this description. The fourth one matches the description that we just saw of the Antichrist. So it's a direct callback to Daniel and to world domination, which every first century Jew would have gone, oh yeah, but every first century Roman would have scratched their heads and go, what crazy thing is this going on? They would not have understood it. We then move along to verse three. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. So a wound healed. Who or what is this? The beast that recovers from a seemingly fatal head wound is the Antichrist. That's who we're talking about here. The question that we have is, what does this wound to the head mean? Some people believe that it means the Antichrist will be an individual person who will receive a head wound physically, and that when, while anybody else would have died from that head wound, they recover from it, and that makes everybody go, wow, that's amazing. Is that possible? Yeah, that's possible. Is it probable? I don't think so. Here's why. Later on in chapter 17, verse 14, I believe it is, you're going to see that the wound comes from a sword. The likelihood today that a world leader is gonna rise up and be wounded with a sword in the head is unlikely. It could happen, I'm not ruling it out. But the sword in scripture, and especially the sword in Revelation is always symbol of military power. So more likely what this means is that the, the, the leader will rise up, a, a, a kingdom, a nation, a corporation today, who knows? It will be strong, it will be world dominant, it will receive a blow to its authority, its head. It will look like it's on the ropes and it's about dead. And it will virtually miraculously come back from a seemingly fatal wound. If it's a physical wound, it's a physical wound. I think it's more likely that people will see, let's say a kingdom, a king and a nation, a political power with a great army going in and it looks like, oh, this army's defeated, they're done. And they rally in the fourth quarter and they come back with the most amazing comeback in military history. And at that point, the world goes, wow, any general that could pull that off, we want that general running the whole world because they know how to come back from, from seemingly fatal defeat. That appears to me to be more likely than an actual physical head wound, but however it works out, doesn't really concern me at all. But it, the, the idea will be that the Antichrist will be given power in part at least 
because they prove themselves to be near miraculously able to recover from difficulty. And the world is going to need that kind of power during that period of time. So that's my take on it anyway. Verse 4 of Revelation 13. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? This is another reason why I believe that fatal wound is not to uh, the actual physical head, but it's a defeat in battle or near defeat in battle, because this here is talking about who is like the beast, who can wage war against it, where does that come from, unless there was a war that looked like it was lost, and in the last minute came back in a virtually miraculous recovery from the war, so now please lead us. It tells us that during this period of time, people will worship the dragon, the Antichrist, and will worship the beast. During this time, there will be a huge rise in idolatry during the Great Tribulation. We've already seen that. We're not talking about metaphorical idols, about, you know, simply just putting something before God, although that is idolatry. We're talking about physical idols of wood and stone and brick and metal. People are going to bow down and worship the images of the Antichrist and of the beast. That's what's going to happen during the Tribulation. We move along there to verses 5 and 6. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. 42 months, there we go, that three and a half year thing again, right? Verse 6, it opened its, ma- it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So, the Antichrist will speak openly against the things of God during the Great Tribulation. This is actually another callback to Daniel and to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 8 says this, While I was thinking about the horns, horns in Daniel, horns in Revelation, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. Oh, how cute. Yeah, not so much. And three of the first horns were uprooted before. It's like this little horn comes up like a, a, a tooth coming up under your existing teeth and knocking three of them out. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So what happens? Out of the mouth of this beast that we've seen here in Revelation, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God. The little, the, the, the little horn in Daniel knocks out three of the other horns and has a mouth that speaks boastfully. So it looks like this may be a further explanation of the little horn. So it looks as though there's some kind of a takeover where this little horn comes along at the last minute, uproots three of the other powers, and takes over. And that, in fact, the the rooting out of the other three may be the battle that it looked like he was going to be killed from and he recovered from. We don't know for sure. But it is a, a, a fascinating little piece how it matches the book of Daniel just so perfectly here. This wound, this wounding of the false prophet, the beast from the sea, uh, of the of the Antichrist, I mean, the beast from the sea, appears to mark the halfway point of the tribulation because the worship will last 42 months. And remember, 42 months is always the symbol of the last half of the tribulation, um, or the first, actually, of the first half of the tribulation. So this, this may, the, they will worship him up until 42 months, and then the wound turns it into something else for the rest of the tribulation. We then move along from there to verse 7, 8, and 9. And now we continue on with the beast from the sea, verses 7, 8, and 9. It was it, the beast from the sea, was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, whoever has ears, let them hear. So, the Antichrist, called from the sea, will actively wage war against those who follow Christ. Here's an interesting part of it. Verse 9 of Revelation 13 says, whoever has ears, let them hear. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we saw that seven times in verses in chapters 2 and 3, but there's a difference here. In chapters 2 and 3, Whoever has ears, let them hear, was always followed by what the Spirit says to the churches. Here is just, whoever has ears, let them hear. There's no Spirit speaking to the churches. Why? Because, as I've stated before, I believe that at this point, the rapture will have happened. 
the church will be gone and the Holy Spirit who lives in us will go with us. There won't be any spirit left. There won't be any church as it exists today left. So you at this point can't say, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches because there's no church on earth as it currently exists. There will be those who have come to Christ since the tribulation, but they won't be coming to Christ in a situation like we have today where we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about that before, so we won't go into, in, into it in detail now. So, But that is an interesting rephrasing of that phrase right there. So that's what's missing. Um, okay, we'll move on from there to verse 10. If anyone is to go into captivity, and, and now we'll, uh, yeah, continuing on the beast from the sea. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, with the sword, they will be killed. Okay. That sounds redundant. There's a reason for it. We'll get into it in a moment. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Why is it doing this kind of repetitive thing? If anyone is was to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with the sword, they will be killed. What's happening here? This is a virtual re-paraphrase and restatement of the Old Testament principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Into jail, you'll stay in jail. Into captivity, you'll stay in captivity. Killed with the sword, you'll be killed with the sword. This is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Because in the great, in the tribulation, God will deal with people as he did in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's the era of grace. In the Old Testament, it was the era of law. Today, in the era of grace, an eye for an eye seems severe. And it's, it is severe, but it's just. In the Old Testament, an eye for an eye was a relief because before God gave the principle of an eye for an eye, you know what it was? It was a death for an eye. You take out my eye, I kill you. And God says, no, they take out your eye, you take out their eye. Is that brutal? Yes. But is it fair? Yes. And it is certainly more fair than what they had been doing, which was you take out my eye, I take out your life. But now under grace, as we live today under Jesus, what does Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. You slap me. I'm not going to slap you back. I'm going to turn the other cheek. We live in an era of grace. Once the church is gone and the Holy Spirit with us, we will go back to an era where the best we can hope for is justice, which is prison for the prisoners and, and the sword for those who use the sword. It's, and you're going to have to have, as it says here, patient endurance and faithfulness for those who come to Christ during that time to live for Christ during an era that's more similar to the Old Testament than the New where the law is the best you can hope for and where grace is nowhere to be found. It's going to be a challenging time for those who come to Christ during the tribulation. We move from there then to verses 11 through 13, and we're going to see for the first time the second beast out of this chapter, the beast from the land. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Oh, I got horns and dragons again. But now you know what some of this symbolizes already, right? It exercised all the authority of the first beast, on its behalf, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Um, where do we go? Oh, and it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of the people. Okay, what's going on here? First beast comes out of the sea, the Gentile nations. The second beast comes out of the land, which means out of Israel. So the beast from the land is coming out of Israel, and the second beast is someone that we call the false prophet. First beast out of the sea, Antichrist. Second beast out of the land, we call the false prophet. This beast, it says, has two horns. That's power, similar to the lamb had, the kind of authority the lamb had, so it's an imitation of Jesus. Spoke like the dragon, which means it has satanic words that is coming out of it. And this is not chronological. It doesn't necessarily mean that one appears after the other. It's second in authority, not necessarily second chronologically. And the arrival of this second beast completes this, what I'm calling the satanic version of the Trinity. That almost sounds like a title of a movie, right? The satanic version of the Trinity. And here's what I mean. The devil has been around long enough to be intelligent. Well, but he's not really smart. He's clever. And he's not created. He can't create anything. The best he can do is try to imitate what God created. So take a look at what happens or what we've seen so far. We've got a dragon, we've got the first beast, and we've got the second beast. And take a look at what we know about each of them. Uh, let me get my 
the little picture out of the way so you can grab that screenshot there if you need to. There we go. Okay. So you've got the first one is the dragon. He is Satan. That is very clear. He is the counterfeit to God. He is not the polar opposite of God because God is, has power that Satan does not have. So he is not the opposite of God. He is an attempted, um, he's an attempt to duplicate God, but is a poor imitation thereof. And his role is he's the one who has all the power. Secondly, the first beast that comes out of the sea, he is the Antichrist. He is the counterfeit to the real Christ, to Jesus. And we know him because he was wounded and he was healed. Again, just like Jesus, wounded on the cross and raised to, raised to life again. The best thing that the Antichrist can do is seems to have a fatal head wound and then comes back. Whereas Jesus actually did die and actually did rise from the dead, the best thing the devil can do is imitate it and kind of look like he might be dead, but he isn't. And then the second beast, this one that comes out of the land, is what we call the false prophet. He is a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because his job is to point to the beast and to get people to worship the beast, just like the Holy Spirit's job is always to point us to Christ. You see that? The, the way they interplay is a, a cheap and sad attempt to imitate the amazing relationship that actually does exist in the Trinity between God the Father, God the Son, and, the Holy, and God the Holy Spirit. This is an attempt to duplicate that in a very, very sad way with the dragon, the, false, the, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So, when you see all of this pulled together, you see that the best thing that Satan has is to attempt to duplicate what God has, and he can't even come up with a new way to do it himself. He is at best a pale imitation. So from there, we move on to verse 14. There we go. On to verse 14. I'm sorry, I, I know this arrow is always in my way because I can't see this on my screen until I move it. So now you see it on your screen, I don't see it on mine. So if you've been going through this and wondering, why does he keep the arrow in the middle of the screen? Because it disappears on me, it's there to you. So I'm gonna put it over here so it's completely out of the way. I try to I try to remember to remove it when it's not visible on my screen. Oh well, if that's the worst thing that happens, I guess we'll all be okay. Verses 14 and 15. Because of the signs it was given, because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. This is now the false prophet, the beast from the land. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So here's what we talked about earlier, wounded by the sword, okay? Verse 15, the second beast was given power to give breath to the, first, to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So again, like we just saw in the previous chart, the, the false prophet is an attempt to duplicate the Holy Spirit's role in the Trinity, which is always to point to the Antichrist. It's given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It sets up an image to be worshipped of the first beast. It gives breath to the image of the first beast. If you don't worship the first beast, it enforces you. This is like the vice principle. Okay, so the false prophet is, is, is always there to serve the Antichrist. So the false prophet causes everyone to make a decision about the Antichrist. You worship the Antichrist or you don't. If you do, then great, as far as the false prophet is concerned. And if not, he's going to come and get you. What does he do? He sets up a graven image. We talked about it earlier. Idolatry will be very common during this time, during the tribulation. And this, of course, is a direct violation to one of the Ten Commandments, not to worship any graven image. So this mark, uh, th this is going to happen that way. So now we get to what we talked about earlier that we were going to look at. Finally, the mark of the beast. We see two beasts. Now we get to the mark of the beast in verses 7, 16 and 17. It, the false prophet, also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So this is now what we have commonly called the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is ordered by the false prophet on behalf of the beast, and it will be a sign that people have chosen to worship the beast. And if you don't receive the mark, you cannot buy, you cannot sell, you cannot have a job, you're going to be left out of everything that functions in the world today. So it says they forced everyone to receive it, and 
and also caused everyone to receive it. So it's a passive verb, a passive verb, which means, okay, everybody do it. And then an active verb, which is, if you don't do it, we're going to make you do it. Okay. So that's, and it's done in the two most commonly exposed places on the body, our foreheads and the back of our hands. Today, we can do that easily with technology. And I keep seeing online all kinds of indications that we're going to be doing this. I don't know how much of that is true, but we certainly have the technology to do that today by implanting a chip so that you could walk into a store and walk out and never have to worry about a credit card. So is that likely to happen something like that? Yeah, probably. We certainly have the ability to do so. But where does this idea come from of marking the head or marking the back of the hand? Well, a couple of things. First of all, Back in chapter 7, we had the mark given by God to the 144,000, which is a symbol of the Jewish people who come to believe in Christ. They are given a mark on the head and on the, on the, on the hand as a mark of God. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where God says, I want you to take this law that I've given to you, and I want, to mark it, want you to mark it on your forehead or on the back of your hand. That does not mean physically so. What he's saying is, I want you to live in such a way that when everybody sees you, they see my law. Whenever you do an action, you see my law in action. So people see me, they see God. When, when I commit an action, I, I see God in action. So that's what that means. Now, there are people who have taken this seriously to the point of being literal. And we have some friends around who are ultra conservative um, Jews and very conservative Jews actually do this still today. They did it back in Jesus day. They did it before Jesus day. And there are some who still do it today. This is an actual picture, as you can see, of dedicated Jewish males. And they are showing a young Jewish male. Let me uh, show you here. They are showing this young Jewish male here how to tie the phylactery onto his hand. So you see the ribbon goes around the hand multiple times. And then on the back of the hand is a little box, which actually has a little scroll, which has the law in it. They also tie it to their heads. You can see it here, here, here. Here's the most obvious one. This is a little box. And inside that little box is an actual scroll. And on that scroll is the law from Deuteronomy that says you're to tie this to your hands, to, to your forehead or to your hands. So uh, ultra conservative Jewish males actually do this during their time of prayer. Is this what God meant in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, that we should actually physically tie it there? No, it's about being recognized anywhere you go for being a person of the law and making sure that every action you commit with your hands is, is the law being done. That's what it is. But there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. There's something I think kind of beautiful about people who take it literally to that point and they are willing to be physically seen that way. They do it only during times of prayer. They typically don't walk around the streets uh, like that. It is specifically for their times of prayer, but that's still done today. And that's called a phylactery or sometimes called a tephalin. Tephalin or phylactery is what those little boxes are called. Verse 18, we move along. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast. So the mark of the beast, which is a pale imitation of Deuteronomy telling us to put the law of God on our forehead and on the back of our hand. Wow, are you hearing that as well? It's a Helicopter going overhead. I'll just talk loud over it. I'm sure you can hear it too because it's pretty loud, but I'll talk over it. So this imitation of that, just like in that box that you just saw, they had the, the law printed, what was printed on or, or what, was, what was the symbol that, was, that went along with the mark of the beast. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man that number is. And here's one of the most famous images in all of Scripture. Six, six, six. So why six, six, six? Well, first of all, it says if we have insight to calculate the number. And secondly, it says it's the number of a man. So how do we use wisdom to calculate this number? And what does it mean that it's a number of a man? First of all, I don't want to spend too much time here because, man, the vast majority of teaching on Revelation is all about Mark of the Beast and what does 666 mean? And people spend way too much time on it and get people way too afraid over it. Is it serious? Yes. Should we be concerned about it? Yes. Should we try to figure out what it is? Yes. It says this calls for wisdom and we should try to calculate it. But 
it's one verse out of the entire book and we're only going to give it the amount of time that one verse is due. So let me give you a quick explanation of what's happening here. The Hebrew and Greek letters out of the alphabet all had numeric equivalents. It would be similar to A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, D equals 4. It isn't that because we don't do it like that. When we see a word, we don't immediately look at it and go, which number of the letter in the alphabet is that letter? But in both Greek and Hebrew languages, each of the letters had a very strong numerical equivalent. And they would often write in ways that kept that numerical equivalent in mind. So especially in Hebrew, which is when you go back to the Old Testament, what you're going to see it's called alphanumerics. It's this idea that each number has a, a, a letter equivalent, and each, more importantly, each letter has a numerical equivalent. And people who like codes and like cracking the code and like coming up with a secret way of looking at things love alphanumerics because it just has all of that puzzle thing to it. Uh, I'm not going to worry about all of that. I am just telling you that that's a part of what happens. So 666 has all kinds of different interpretations through alphanumerics. And everybody you talk to who loves alphanumerics has a different answer about what word that means, about what name that means. Every once in a while, you'll have somebody come along and say, the last three US presidents, when you convert the letters of their name to the Hebrew equivalents, and then you change it over to the numbers, it matches up to 666 when you add it up in this way or whatever. There's a ton of that out there. That I don't think is using wisdom. I don't think we're going to have to use real wisdom about it until it act, they actually show up and then you look at it and go, okay, that's a 666 thing going on. But that's what it has to do with. It has to do with alphanumerics and the fact that every Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. So we're not worrying about it today. I'm not going to spend much more time on it than that because the Antichrist is not going to be revealed to the world until after the start of the tribulation. And I don't plan to be here for that. If I am, if I'm wrong about the rapture and we are here, We'll figure it out then. We've got the passage. We know what it means. And at that point, we will be able to apply it in a way that will help us decipher what's going on. So it is a way of tipping the hand so that the people who are alive during the tribulation, who are trying to serve Jesus during the tribulation, will have some understanding and a warning about not taking the mark of the beast and about how to identify it somehow alphanumerically through the number 666. But what this... Uh, finally leads to is, oh, there we go. Uh, verse, uh, where did we go here? Okay. Oh, second, second Thessalonians. I've got that on the screen for you. Let's, so let's take a look at what that says. Second, Thess second Thessalonians, uh, verses six through eight says in part this, the one who now holds it back, that is the one who is now holding evil back from the earth today, as we currently exist. And as at the time Thessalonians was being written, the Apostle Paul says, the, the, one, the one who was holding evil back, God the Holy Spirit in us who was holding evil back, the one who now holds evil back, it back, will continue to do so until it is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That's a very shortened version of a longer passage because of the amount of time it would take to get into it. But again, one of the reasons that I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 through 8, if you take a look at it closely, appears to be saying that evil is held back on the earth now and will continue to be held back until the one who is holding it back is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So if you believe, as I do, in a pre-tribulation rapture, what that means is the lawless one, the Antichrist, is not going to be revealed until the church has been raptured and we're out of the way. Will the Antichrist be alive at that time already? Certainly, because you cannot rule as an adult in a seven-year period of time if you have not already been living through childhood and through teenage years and to become an adult. So is it possible that the Antichrist is alive on the earth today? Yes, that's possible. Because if the rapture happens today or tomorrow or next week, the Antichrist needs to be a fully functioning adult and probably in some position of power that they can leverage for even greater power. Who is it? I don't know. What country do they come from? I don't know. Are they the head of a country or the head of a corporation? I don't know. Nobody knows because he hasn't been revealed yet and he will not be revealed until the tribulation, according to that passage. 
in Second Thessalonians. So that's a whole bunch going on today, all kinds of interesting things. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm fudging on these things when I say I don't know what 666 means. I don't know if the Antichrist is alive today. I'm not just hedging my bets on this. These are simply mysteries that are not going to be revealed fully until later. There are certain things we can know about them so that we can anticipate these times, so that we can prepare to live properly in the meantime. But a whole lot of these things are not going to be revealed until after the rapture occurs. And if I'm right on that and the rapture occurs first, then I'm not going to have to decode all of that because I won't be here. But it will be written down so that those who do remain and who understand this as biblical fulfillment can go to the book of Revelation during the tribulation, see these clues, get an idea of how to defend themselves against it, and make sure that they aren't deceived as well. So a lot going on there. I hope you enjoyed that today. See you next time.